Hopefully you recognize this formula. This is Newton's second law. And what Newton's second law allows you to do is if you know the forces on an object and the mass, it gives you a way to determine the acceleration. Now here's the thing. If those forces on the object are constant, so if they are not changing in time, they remain the same values over time, that means the acceleration is going to be constant. Why do we care about this? Well, if the acceleration is constant, you can use the kinematic formulas. That's the condition that has to be met in order for these kinematic formulas to be true. In other words, if you know that the forces are constant, the acceleration is constant, and once you find that acceleration, you can just plug those into these kinematic formulas, and that would give you things like the velocity as a function of time. So if you found this acceleration, you could say that the velocity as a function of time is just going to be the initial velocity plus that constant acceleration times the time. This would be the velocity as a function of time. But what if the forces on the object are not constant? Well, that would mean that the acceleration is not constant. In other words, let's say this net force is increasing over time. That means your acceleration would be increasing over time. That means it's not constant and you can no longer use the kinematic formulas because they're only true when the acceleration is constant. And that means you can't just do this because you won't have a constant A to plug in here. So what do you do? What if the forces are varying? Well, in that case, you're gonna have to use calculus. If the rate of change of something is varying, in other words, this acceleration, which is a rate of change of velocity, if that's varying, we're gonna use calculus to figure out what's going on. So let's make this a little more specific. Let's say instead of just saying net force, let's say we knew that the force on the object was given by some function three times t. So the net force, let's say we know, is three times t. There's some force and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time increases. Well, this acceleration isn't gonna be constant. How could we ever get the velocity as a function of time? We can't use kinematic formulas, but what we can do is say, all right, I know what acceleration is in terms of velocity. I can write this as a derivative. I can say that the acceleration, in fact, I'll just erase this, and I'll replace acceleration with the derivative of something with respect to time. What is it the derivative of? It's the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. So you might be wondering, why do we do this? We just made this equation even messier. This is what you're gonna have to do. If this function's varying in time, you're gonna have to write your acceleration as a derivative. And what that gives you is a differential equation. Now, that's a fancy word or a fancy term that just means an equation, there's an equality sign here, that involves a derivative. So how is this going to get us to the velocity as a function of time? We're gonna use a technique called the separation of variables. So this derivative really is a fraction. It's a small change in velocity over a small change in time. And so I can separate this just like any fraction. I can imagine multiplying both sides by dt. I'll just copy this and put it down here. So if I multiply both sides by dt, this dt is gonna come over to this side and I don't need that anymore and I get that the small change in velocity over this amount of time is gonna be this, three times the time divided by the mass times that small infinitesimal duration in time. And so what do I do to get the velocity? I don't want the infinitesimal change in velocity. I want the velocity at a specific time. Well, what you do is you integrate both sides. I can add up all of these changes in velocity and that would give me the total change in velocity. So this integral you can think of as a summation over an infinite amount of infinitesimal changes in velocity. And if you add up all those infinitesimal changes in velocity, you'll get the total change in velocity. So this left-hand side is really the total change in velocity. And this right-hand side is equivalent to that because we know that the net force over the mass at any moment is giving you the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So what do we get if we integrate this right-hand side? Well, one thing we should do, we could be more precise, we can put limits in here, and I could say that, all right, this time is going from some initial time to some final time. What should my initial time be? Well, it's useful to just call that t equals zero. Let's just start our clock. When this velocity has some initial velocity, we can call it v zero. So maybe it starts at rest, maybe it doesn't, but it starts with some initial velocity at a time t equals zero. You can start your clock whenever you want it, and physicists typically just start it at zero because it makes it easier. I mean, I could have written a three here and say my clock starts at three seconds 
and this would be the velocity it had at three seconds, but that's just making things more complicated than they need to be. How long would I go? I want velocity as a function of time, so I'm gonna go until some time t. I don't wanna just solve this for one particular time. I don't wanna know what the velocity was after exactly 2.3 seconds. I want a function at the very end of this that gives me what the velocity is at any given time t. And so what would my limit over here be? Well, this would be the velocity that the object has at that time t. So this is really the velocity, not at zero, it would be the velocity at time t. And that's why on the left-hand side, I just get change in v, because look at what I really get. I can be more specific here. What I'm really getting is the integral of dv is just v, and I evaluate that between v initial and v at time t, which, if I just continue on down here, is going to be, well, v at time t, minus v initial is really just the change in velocity that happened during this time interval zero to t. But what do I get on the right hand side? Well, let's see, the three is a constant, the m is a constant, I can pull that to the left, so I get a three over m times the integral of t with respect to t. So what's the integral of t? Well, that's just t squared over two. So I could write this as t squared divided by two evaluated between what and what? It'd be zero and t. So what do I get? Well, I get a three over m times t squared over two minus zero squared over two, but the zero squared over two is just zero, so that limit just gives me zero, and I really just end up with t squared over two. So how does this help? Well, now we can solve this for v. I'm gonna continue on down here, and I'm gonna say that v as a function of time, if I just add v not to both sides, I'll get v as a function of time is v initial plus, now this makes sense, look at what it's saying. It's saying the velocity I have at time t is gonna be equal to the velocity I had initially plus however much change in velocity there was over this time interval. That's what this integral was giving you. And what do I get? I get t squared over two times three over m. So I get three halves t squared over m. So this is the velocity of the object as a function of time. It's not a kinematic formula. It looks kind of like a kinematic formula. It's got v equals some v initial plus some amount of change in velocity, but you can't just say the change in velocity is a t. The change in velocity during this time was three halves t squared over m. So recapping, if your forces are not constant, you'll have to write that force as a function of, say, time or velocity or whatever it might be, which means you'll have to write the acceleration as a derivative. That gives you a differential equation that you can solve to get the velocity as a function of time.